Okay, uh, 2.47, a purely conceptual problem. Uh, we're given the double square well, uh, and we are told to sketch the ground state wave function and also the first excited state wave function for three cases. So let's start this right away with case one, which is when B is equal to zero. So in this case, uh, our wells are joined together. We effectively just have a single finite square well. We already know what the solutions look like for this. Uh, they are just the standard sinusoids. The wave function for psi 1 is going to look something like... Uh, whoops, I should really center my graph. The wave function for psi 1 is going to look something like this where there's exponential decay as you go to the edges of the well because it's a finite well. Uh, the first excited state, psi 2, is going to look something like, assuming that these are the edges of the well, uh, we get something like something like this. And just for symmetry, I'm going to make the edge of the well over there instead. Okay, so this is something we've we've sort of encountered many times before, and it's something that we have uh, should be very familiar with at this point, so this doesn't really need any more explanation. Let's now do case two, where B is roughly equal to A. So case two is basically saying, okay, the gap in the middle here is on a scale comparable to the size of the wells themselves. Uh, this hopefully is also familiar uh, because we know that exponential decay occurs in regions where the potential is larger than the energy of the wave function. So because of that, uh, what we're going to get is effectively a sort of almost exactly like the delta well case uh, from an earlier problem where we had a delta well barrier in the middle of a finite square well. So what effectively happens is our psi 1 is going to start looking something like this now instead, where we have the same sort of exponential decay at the edges of the barrier, but we also now have this extra condition that we need exponential decay sort of along the region of B as well. So now we have something that looks... So our original wave function... Uh, let's draw the original one first, actually. It looks something like this. Uh, now, with this sort of new area in the middle that requires us... Let's draw this in blue, actually, just to make this... So now with this new region in B, which is sort of requiring the wave function to exponentially decay in the middle, our wave function is going to now look something like... And let's, you know, let's enforce that psi 1's in green, uh, it's going to look something like this. Where in order to match sort of the requirement of the wave function exponentially decaying in the middle region, we now have two peaks instead of one. So this is the new ground state. Similarly, uh, the first excited state is now going to look something like so we have our edges of our well, and then we have the exponential decay region of B. Our original wave function looks something like this. Uh, our new wave function is going to look something like this. where there's this exponential decay in the middle, and then everything else is roughly the exact same. Uh, so then we move on to case three, which is that B is way larger than A, and we have exactly the same behavior, only now sort of the decay region is just larger. So our ground state wave function is going to look something like this now. You know, where this is our new decay region for B. And then our first excited state is going to look something like uh, this now. Where, once again, this is our really big decay region for B. Uh, and yeah, that's really it for part A. Okay, uh, part B is what I would say to be the more tricky part, which is quantitatively, uh, how do the corresponding energies E1 and E2 vary as B goes from 0 to infinity? So let's start by looking at 
b equals zero. So when b is equal to zero, we just have you know the standard finite square well. Where you know e one is obviously less than e two, where if we graphed it, you know, this would be like e one and this would be like e two for our finite square well. Now uh, the key thing is that as b goes to infinity, what happens is our wave functions start looking kind of very similar to each other. So if you remember, you know, the wave function for the ground state looked something like this, and then the wave function for the first excited state looked something like this. Now, uh, the key thing to remember here is that the, f the physical thing that matters is the magnitude of psi squared. And in terms of this, you know, if this is psi 1 and this is psi 2, what we're seeing here is that actually their magnitude squares are the exact same. Because the magnitude squared is going to look something like, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look something like this, uh, it, where like the, the resulting thing is squared. Same thing here. This is going to look something like this. This is negative, but if you square it, it's going to go up positive like this. So really, the magnitude squared of psi 1 and psi 2 kind of become equivalent to each other as b goes to infinity. So as b goes to infinity, the magnitude of psi 1 squared sort of begins to look exactly like the magnitude of psi 2 squared. And what that implies is that since this is the physical thing that matters, these two wave functions basically end up describing the same phenomenon. Uh, the corresponding energies also end up becoming roughly equivalent to each other as a result as well, because of the fact that these wave functions effectively become equivalent to each other in terms of their magnitude squareds. So as a result of that, we say E1 gradually becomes equivalent to E2. So what that means is that uh, our graphs as let's say as b goes to infinity right so this is b and then let's say that this is the energies if you know e1 starts here and e1 e2 starts here what's going to happen is that they're going to meet somewhere in the middle uh at some point and uh we don't really know how they'll approach this same value but we know that you know obviously it can't be linear because if it was linear uh the whole point is that as b goes to infinity the energies approach each other e each other so if there was a linear relation where it approached linearly it's going to eventually cross this line it's going to keep on going to negative infinity e1 is going to eventually cross this line go to positive infinity no matter how small the linear relation is is so more realistically uh the more probable uh, result is probably going to be some sort of exponential relation where e2 is going to exponentially decay to this central value whatever it may be and e1 is going to grow logarithmic logarithmic logarithmically to that same value so uh once again this is purely conceptual we're not doing any calculations this is just sort of uh what we're assuming is going to happen based off of the behavior of these wave functions because once again the thing that matters is not the wave function but the magnitude squared of the wave function and when two wave functions have the same magnitude squared uh result that sort of implies that on a physical level everything about them is identical and since energy is a physical thing two wave functions that have the same magnitude squared terms are going to have the same energies. So because of that, we expect energy two of the first excited state to gradually go down to approach the middle value, and we expect energy one of the ground state to gradually go up to reach the excited, uh, to reach the sort of the middle value. And this isn't necessarily exactly in the middle. It could be like, you know, more skewed towards E1 or more skewed towards E2. We don't know, but quantitatively, uh, this is, or qualitatively, this is sort of the kind of graph that we would expect for the energies of E1 and E2 as you sort of have B approach infinity. Okay, finally, part C, sort of the logical conclusion to everything. Uh, the double well is a very primitive one-dimensional model for the potential experienced by an electron in a diatomic molecule, where the two wells sort of represent attractive forces of the nuclei. So if the nuclei are free to move, they will always adopt the configuration of minimum energy, aka uh, if the two wells are free to sort of move around, they will always adopt the configuration of minimum energy. So in view of our conclusions from part B, does the electron tend to draw the nuclei together or does it tend to push them apart? So uh, if we look at this, you know, uh, at this graph, these points uh, represent 
sort of E1 and E2, which are the base state energy and the first excited state energy when B is equal to zero. You know, this point right here is B is equal to zero. So what we see, so, you know, we're dealing with the first, the, the ground state and the first excited state. So let's look at an electron in the first, in the ground state and also an electron in the first excited state. So for an electron in the ground state, and let's say that this middle point is like, you know, uh, let's call it like A. Let's call this middle point where they meet A. So uh, E1, the ground state energy of B at B equals to zero is less than A. If I want to write it in mathematical notation, E1 at zero is less than A. And we can see that from this graph, you know, the energy of the ground state wave function is going to be less than the middle point. Uh, where the two meet at b equals to infinity so for an electron in the ground state uh it's going to want to attract the two nuclei in order to try to get b to equal zero so that the resulting energy of the first wave uh, of the ground state wave function is going to be at a minimum so uh the nuclei are attracted together in contrast for an electron in the first excited state for an electron in the first excited state. We have E2 of B at B equals to zero is greater than A. If you look at it, right, E2 is higher than A at B equals to zero. So what that means is that uh, the first excited state, in order to minimize its resulting energy, is going to want to push the nuclei apart to infinity in order to get the resulting energy of the wave function down to this middle point at A. So the nuclei are repelled. So depending on whether an electron is in the ground state or the first excited state, the resulting behavior is going to be different. In the ground state, it'll try to pull the nuclei together. In the first excited state, it'll try to sort of push them apart. And with that, we are done with this problem.